Hi everybody, this is Three Cyber War Myths. I'm uh, speaking here at RSA, or technically in my hotel room, since this is the practice run. Uh, but either way, uh, this is the talk for RSA Conference 2012. You'll notice it is of general interest. I think everybody should listen to it. And obviously the first thing that I like to uh, ask everybody is where this wall is. I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it, but uh, if you did get it, is in fact uh, the CIA's entranceway, which I hope is meant to be ironic, because it, it clearly is. Um, and in that context of giant piles of irony, the news for the past year or even year and a half has been focused very largely on the growing risk of cyber war, the growing professionalism of cyber war, and perhaps the impact of cyber war on our society at large, you'll see uh, CNAS, CSIS, and other policy engines in the United States here, including those uh, who have great reach into NATO and, and other arms, uh, publishing giant policy papers on how they think this should be handled. You'll see conferences such as RSA talk about it quite a bit, uh, Black Hat, that sort of thing. And of course, uh, this year you saw the stand-up of the Cyber uh, Command up at Fort Meade, Maryland, uh, adjoining the NSA, uh, and the Pentagon declaring cyberspace a new warfare domain, along with land, sea, air, and whatnot. Uh, obviously, these are, you know, this is the background to what, what we want to talk about today, uh, which is trying to change how people think about uh, cybersecurity and cyber warfare all at once. This is a panel that was at RSA. Uh, you know, in particular, Eric there uh, is deputy director of uh, Defense Department in charge of cyber affairs. Uh, had quite a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, I can comment further on various things the others said, but largely, I think you're going to see them uh, coming to grips with the the three fallacies that I talk about. Uh, and of course, for those of you who are in the defensive area, you've no doubt. Uh, looked at a lot of the LULSEC thing. This is the other side of the story of people getting to grips with the true power of what cyber war can bring to you. And getting to grips with it means letting go of some of the things that you always thought were true. Uh, one of those things is that cyber war is asymmetric, uh, meaning that the smaller players have an advantage. Uh, one of the other things is that cyber war is non-kinetic, meaning that it can't cause physical damage to you. And one of the other things is that cyber war is not attributable, meaning you won't know who does it when they do it to you. So uh, I posit that none of these things is actually true, and that when we get better at cyber war, as we learn more about it, we're going to realize uh, what that does to the playing field. And the other thing I like to talk about in this talk is why security groups think these things are true. Because a lot of these things you'll see over and over in those CNAS papers and all the other papers that sort of define current thinking. And before we get too deep into that, I want to talk a little bit about what a cyber weapon is. Because journalist after journalist has come up and said, hey, I'd like to talk to you guys about O-Days. And my thoughts around that are that O-Days are a very important but very small part of the puzzle of what a cyber weapon truly is. I think people focus on the O-Days and miss out on what the weapon is. And uh, for those of you with children, you may have read The Bunyip of Berkeley's Creek. It's a great little story, and it's about this creature that sort of arises out of the muck in an Australian pond somewhere, and then uh, asks the other creatures around it both what it is and then what it looks like. And so some of these same questions are what I'd like to answer today in the talk. And you can see the DOD sort of muddling around with it a bit. You know, list of cyber weapons developed by Pentagon to streamline cyber computer warfare. Um, you know, you can see Keith Alexander there uh, getting promoted to Cyber Command. You can see uh, a few things. You know, we want to manage it like we manage an M16 is the kind of phrasing you'll see. But I think it's careful to watch what, what a cyber weapon really is not. Uh, one thing it's not is it's not a fielded system like a tank that has a uh, that kind of supply chain and building and timeline. I think one of the things about tanks is they take 10 years to build. 
you know, you design them, you build them, you feel them, they, they work for another 20, 30 years, uh, you know, and there's some additions and stuff that go into that, but this is just simply not uh, the way cyber works, you know, that would be, you, I mean, we'll have brain implants by the time someone develops something according to Army standard procurement. The the other thing, it's not as a individually held rifle that, that you can really train anybody to use and is maintained and kept by the, the individual soldiers. It's just not like that. Um, and, you know, so, so what you get is people thinking, well, in that case, it must be an exploit kit or an exploit pack or one exploit or any of these things. You know, it's weaponized exploit. And in immunity, we never use the term weaponized. We use the term QA'd. Uh, but weaponized is not what, the, these are not weapons, this is code, these are, you know, protected by the First Amendment, among other things. Um, but, I mean, even here, I mean, the Phoenix Exploits Kit or all the other little exploit kits, th those are not cyber weapons by our, our terminology. And uh, I think, in, this, in a sense, cyber weapons are different in a, in a different way. So, I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, where we posit this, how do we decide what to build, how do you build something that's useful. Um, and you can take the defensive thought around security often, which is availability, uh, integrity, and confidentiality. And you can say, well, from an attacker, I don't think of it quite like that. I really think of it in a different way. Um, and the, the sort of things I think about are, you know, does it get you access, does it help you analyze, does it remove things, or does it offer things to your enemies? These are the uh, the four that I sort of categorize these weapons in. And if you look at access and analyze, then you're talking about situational awareness. And if you look at removal, you're talking about destroy, deny, degrade, and, and, uh, and that sort of thing, um, to put it in different terms that other people would use. Uh, I think situational awareness, obviously, is one of the more important um, but, you know, destroy, deny, degrade has its place as well. And I love this picture, but uh, Michael Hayden would call, call it changing the terrain in cyberspace. So when you're talking to people who, do not, who have to translate everything cyber in their head into some other terminology because they're historians, as Michael Hayden was, or, uh, you know, from the army or whatever, then you can often say, you know, this... This weapon changes the terrain in a very specific and important way, and it's a significant difference. And, you know, one of the things you'll see is that if you talk about terrain, people will assume that you mean only access. They, they don't think about the rest of it. But destroying a mountain um, changes the terrain if you're going to remove it. Uh, it. You have to sort of translate it somehow. So this is kind of how I translate it to people. Um... Distinguishing marks and features, you know, how it, when you see a, when you see it, you know it, right, is the theory, but what is it you're really looking for in a cyber weapon? I'm going to be looking for something that is global and generic in scope. It is not going to be specific to a particular person, particular company, particular organization. It's going to be something that has distributed infrastructure. Almost all true cyber weapons do. Uh, it'll almost always have a trained and expensive team of operators, and it will almost always have some very interesting data visualization components. And th these could be as simple as a little flash uh, graphic or something extremely complex that, that processes large amounts of data and blasts them into your retina to help you understand it. Uh, the, the data that you look at as well is important because I think a lot of what the commercial SIEM market looks at, a lot of, of what IDSs look at, a lot of what other people look at, focuses on things the attacker knows that you know. Whereas what attackers want to look at is things that you don't know they know. It is the data of the unexpected. That is where actual value is in a cyber weapon. And this is more to do, then, with attack surfaces than with attacks. And so, you know, when we're building something interesting, we're not going to be building something that is focused on a particular, you know, vulnerability in IMAP-D. And I wanted to point out, you know, we have a quite broad definition. You know, I was talking to Kim Zetter of Wired, and she was like, you know, people don't agree with your definition here. And I'm like, well, we don't really care because these, these are the way, this is the way the world works. It doesn't go away just because you don't believe in it. And things like the Pirate Bay, I think, are very, very important cyber weapons. They, they are written by 
team ma written and maintained. They have distributed infrastructure. They have a global and generic impact, and they change the terrain of cyberspace. So, uh, you know, this by offering information, simply by being able to offer information reliably that other people don't want offered, has changed the terrain and has done it successfully for many, many years. Uh, you know, 10 million peers, you know, 100 blog entries. Uh, 2.5 million people use it. You know, honestly, what's one of the most used websites in the world, uh, and, you know, part of that you can see coming out in their humor. But what does it attack? You know, it attacks copyright directly. Uh, the very concept of copyright is something that we've made up. It doesn't really exist. Uh, you know, journalists like Kim probably disagree, but in reality, this is all stuff that, that can go away. And the RIAA and the Motion Picture Association of America know that. And, of course, so do authors. You know, the, the Kindle is an effort to, to make money on content that's really e more easily delivered to you in a torrent. So, you know, the other primary offer, uh, cyber weapon, is WikiLeaks. And I think if you've read what Julian Assange wrote when he was first thinking of WikiLeaks... You can see his brain, he's a little hacker, so maybe it's easier for those in the room who are hackers to see his brain, but you can see him thinking that the wiki is as important as the leaking, right? The analysis is as important as the offering of the information. And deep down, he's sort of, you know, realized, I think now, that the analysis portion has to be done by people who are almost trained in it. Uh, it didn't really work that, to have it you know, sort of crowdsourced, but some of it still does work, right? The, you know, when he offers it up, he also says, hey, by the way, if you find something interesting in here, please put a Twitter link to it, and we'll make that easy for you, and you can hashtag it and put it in there very nicely, and then a simple Twitter search will start picking out all the things people found interesting in what is a giant body of data that otherwise would be unaccessible. So it's not just about making it available over the internet in a reliable way, it's also about making it so that other people can hunt and search in that data and find what they need to find, uh, and that, that's really where the impact comes from. So WikiLeaks, I, I think it, it would be hard to say that WikiLeaks is not a cyber weapon, that it has not changed the terrain of cyberspace. Uh, I think it's probably a little bit more of a stretch to say that low-orbit ion cannon or any of these simple uh, DDoS tools have changed the terrain, but the reality is if you're setting up a website now, everybody on the internet has to deal with the fact that at any moment someone on 4chan will say hey everybody go visit this web page and it will automatically start spamming some other dude with with requests and take him offline so everybody's business now has to be oriented around the fact that our our website might not be online at any given point depending on the whims of 4chan and if that doesn't uh, if that's not changing the terrain then I don't know what is again Shodan I would say is an analysis cyber weapon. I think the scanner is a small part of it. You know, it's it's probably a distributed global scope scanner, but um, it's le relatively limited in reach. Uh, the the analysis and the, the visualization is the really interesting part of Shodan, and uh, you know, to some aspect, the business model as well. So uh, again, I think an important important one, and of course, Stuxnet qualifies as it should, um, and the song on YouTube is probably pretty bad, uh, but, it, you know, it both did access and then it did just, you know, removal of uh, something important, and it's, f you know, following what I think was a very successful cyber weapon, which was this black ice worm that came out in 2004, which hit quite a lot of people, uh, the witty worm if you want to Google it, uh, and, and still to this day no one knows who created this worm. You know, worms are, you know, self-replicating is often a great way to get global impact on the Internet. So I think we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, and the LulzSec and Anonymous crew, I think it's very interesting to note that the LulzSec slash anti-sec slash whatever they're calling themselves today, uh, the access portion of the problem is completely disjoint from the analyzed portion of the problem. Whereas if you look at, like, most people's little wheel of pen test things, they'll say, well, first you break in, then you look at what you found, and you... You find out what you get and where you can go next, which is true, but in this case, splitting it up is very powerful because if you take out the anonymous side of things, the, the, the larger body of it, 
and replace it with WikiLeaks, you still have a functioning system. And that's what happened with the uh, Stratfor hack, for example. Uh, and so, you know, if you look at what a cyber weapon is, I will say that they are defined more by an organization than by a technology. That's, I think, a very important part of what cyber weapons are. And so my conclusions to this portion are that I think the definitions that people currently in the military use for cyber war, cyber weapons, we need to update them to account for what the truth is about how this stuff works. I think you can often broaden your mind by just imagining cyber weapons. So for example, a magic black box that generates SHA-1 hashes, what kind of cyber weapons could you build off that? And I think there are some very interesting things you could do. Uh, I think if you had a list of every SQL injection in the world, every single one, updated nightly, what could you do? I think lots of interesting things. Uh, and likewise, you know, if you want to move into the, you know, time space that we all live in, then having a person locator via all the major uh, engines that locate people would be quite useful. Some of those probably exist. Um, but I think it's, you know, you can think up a hundred more and you're like, wait a minute, there's actually a field of applications here, the same way there's a field of social networking applications. And, and they're quite distinct. Uh, and then you think, well, how would we regulate this stuff, and why are people having so much trouble regulating it? And it's, it's possibly because each cyber weapon is very different. They have different effects on the terrain. So what you end up probably wanting to regulate is just a portion of them, the portion that does the remove, because everything else uh, is, is going to be done a different way every time. And any sort of, you know, you can see the Russians and the United States talking to each other quite a bit about this stuff, but, you know, essentially this fails because they, I don't think they're talking about reality yet. Uh, and the only way anyone's ever really succeeded is attacking the finances of these operations because in the case of what is essentially a NGO, and as WikiLeaks and Pirate Bay and Mega Upload are, uh, the finances are a very important part of how they maintain their large distributed operation. But if they're financed by, say, a, a country or a well-funded NGO, say the Kurds, then uh, you're going to have a lot of trouble attacking the finances. Um, and you're going to have to start attacking the distributed infrastructure, which is going to be in a very difficult position. So let's return then to cyber war. Now that we kind of hopefully have an understanding of what a cyber weapon is, and possibly why you would build one. And we'll talk about why you would use one. Uh, and people, you know, want to get back to the the fallacies of what people think and state straight out that I think people have come to realize in the past year that cyber war is kinetic and it's kinetic in a way that does not always just mean stuff blowing up and if you ever if you ever talk to a truck driver and hopefully you do at some point talk to a truck driver you'll find truck drivers often turn into taxi drivers so you can talk to a taxi driver and learn a little bit about it uh, you will learn that they have to cross the country in about 60 hours. They work as a team. Less than 60 hours would be ideal, right? 50-something hours is, is easily doable from, say, Miami to San Francisco. And, uh, you know, they're driving big rigs and they're driving food because the food doesn't necessarily get uh, made where you eat it, unless maybe you're a hippie, which would be cool. Uh and, and failure in this system, in any way, any logistics failure, is going to have a large, dramatic impact on your life. Uh, when I was in Miami and the power went out for a little bit because of Katrina, which is a hurricane, uh, the, the impact on everyone's life was catastrophic. You can't get gas because the pumps run on electricity and they didn't have enough generators so they could not use their own gas to generate power to give other people gas. Uh, and of course, if you're in a high-rise building, you're, you probably use pumps to get water up to the floors, which means no one had toilets. So that, that's pretty dramatic. So, you know, a, a logistics failure can, as a bonus, often include explosions and instant death when you start interrupting people's uh, ability to uh, supply their troops, but it doesn't have to be. And so this means that because it has dramatic physical effects, maybe not blowing stuff up, but other physical effects, 
you can very easily change a nation state's behavior with cyber war, which is the whole point of war. Uh, and of course, WikiLeaks, I think, is one very key example of that. I think it'd be very hard to state that WikiLeaks has not had a big effect when it screws up your whole domestic policy, or foreign policy, or any policy you have, environmental policy, perhaps. Then, then, you know, you have a you have a big problem. So Stuxnet is the obvious. You know, we caused a direct kinetic effect type thing. And I say we in the larger sense of hackers here, because we don't know who did it. Um, but people talk about it as if it was a Trojan. And be because of that, they focus on the 4-0 day, which always cracks me up, because they're all like, whoa, check out the 4-0 day. And, you know, I think they're good O-day. They're well written. They worked properly. They were the right sort of package of O-Day, um, but I think the O-Day was a very, very small part of it, because behind every wooden horse here is a wood shop. You know, that, that wooden horse didn't just appear. Uh, and the real Stuxnet, in my opinion, is the whole organization that includes the engineers, the analysis, the research and development, the QA people, and the people who, who thought it was an important enough mission to fund. And I, I don't think the mission uh, was necessarily to just destroy the uh, nuclear capability, I think the real message was that we can take out any factory you have at any time. And that's a much more important message, and it's a message that resonates much further than Iran. Iran, I'm sure, was like, that's great, um, you know, we hear you. But so probably was India, China, and everybody else. They were like, wait a minute, that's a developed capability for taking out factories. That's all it does. Um, which is important. Uh, and then, of course, on the opposite side, you have Aurora and those sorts of techniques, which say a very similar thing, but in a financial way. Um, you know, I thought, you know, back in May 2010, uh, they were saying some pretty hilarious things here uh, at RSA uh, about, you know, other people's mm -hmm. problems. And the problems other people were having was... Uh, you know, they're getting hacked, which is easy to write about when it happens to everyone else. So hopefully I'm not tempting fate by giving this talk. But uh, the questions they asked were good. How good are traditional defense mechanisms? Clearly terrible. What control do I have over my employees at work and at home? Well, less than you think, maybe. What sort of data is stolen from the corporation? That'd be all the data, including your private RSA keys. And is there anything that can be done to identify and seal all the gaps? And I think what they were hoping was that buying RSA keys would be the answer. It turned out to be just an extremely ironic posting. Uh, and of course, in every news article, they sort of listed a bunch of companies that had been hit. You know, every, everyone was like, oh, here's a bunch more. That's, that's interesting. But the obvious answer is that everybody got hit, right? Every company has been hit by this one team. Their goal was global presence. Um, and I think... You know, there's luminaries who in the past have said that quantity has a quality all its own. And uh, in cyberspace, that's definitely true. It's probably more true than in physical space. And the only, I think, possible answer, and I think Google's been the only company who had the money to do this, was to pull out. And, uh, you know, this isn't the only country that Google has uh, isolated, and uh, it, it can't be. So it helps, and this is what I think uh, probably was the lessons learned from that, is that if you annoy someone enough, they will pull out, and you will no longer have the access you need. So in a sense, I think the, the mistake here made was, was that I don't believe China thought Google would ever pull out. I think they thought they would always have privileged access to Google's infrastructure, uh, and it was sort of short-sighted to do what they did. So, moving on to attribution, I think you see that, that the easy answer is to be so ubiquitous that you control the space, what the uh, armed forces would call dominate the information battle space. And uh, that's a very difficult thing. It's very different from being anywhere. I think we'll talk a little bit more about how you can be anywhere, but being everywhere is a, is a big whale to swallow. And uh, obviously... Uh, the other side of the story that people look at is they're like, well, with enough situational awareness, I can attack directly the command and control of my opponents, 
and I can gain even more situational awareness that way, and I can also stop their attacks. So that's the other way. Uh, I think you're going to have to get lucky to do that. Uh, you know, but if you look at what they said at the panel on Wednesday, if you look at the history of news articles, I think you'll see that while a particular company has very difficult time doing any attribution, you know, even to a cyber criminal, the nations as a whole are pretty good at figuring out who it was exactly who hit them. They have a lot more resources. They have human and all, SIGINT and other things that they can do. Uh, and, you know, they've been very successful, at, especially in the case of pointing out Chinese attacks. But, um, you know, the reality is also pointing out Stuxnet. You know, it, it, it's not like it was that long until people figured out generally who it was. Uh, and people look at other weapons and they say, well, we can do deterrence on those because we can attribute those, but I don't know that they're all perfectly attributable, and I definitely don't think they're attributable without a great deal of work. So attribution, I think, is doable. Let's talk a little bit about asymmetry, which is, uh, all, everyone always says that cyber war is asymmetric, and you heard a bit of this as well, um at the panel on Wednesday, but then you also heard them say, well, it's really only the peer states that we're truly worried about. So let's talk a little bit about where you're going to see it. You'll, you'll see it from Bruce Schneier and from everyone else. This dates back to 2007, but I think he'll still say it. Martin Lubicki, obviously, is uh, he minimizes cyber in his head. He really just doesn't think it's that important. He said, calls it a niche attack. I think he's uh, short-sighted in that. And then, of course, you'll see it coming from your defense secretaries and, and stuff like that. Uh, so basically everybody, that if you talk to them, will say, well, it's asymmetric. How are we going to attack North Korea, they say. Um, I, think, I think it's probably a bit of a straw man. But uh, the reason they think this is because they know from hiring pen testers, usually, for something like $20,000, that breaking into machines is relatively cheap. They know that, that if you fund a decent enough team at a certain level, you'll be able to get anywhere. Probably not everywhere, but certainly anywhere. And they know that, well, finding O-Days, it costs money, but it's not crazy money. I mean, if you're in the business of buying a tank, then it's not insane money. So the Saudi Arabians are looking at it and thinking, hmm, well, we have money. And they'll look at it and they'll say, well, the infrastructure for doing this stuff isn't that expensive either. Like, if we want to run an operation and we have, you know, enough money to buy some computers somewhere, then theoretically we can do that as well. And bandwidth, you know, is a throw-in, essentially. As much, almost as much bandwidth as you can eat. If Mega Upload can afford it, you know, surely a Saudi prince can afford it. Uh, and this is what spawned that entire industry of banking spyware, is that Getting anywhere is pretty easy, but getting everywhere is hard. And here's where they're sort of wrong about why this changes into asymmetry. Because this does not because of that, they think of asymmetry. But it's not necessarily true. One of those issues is maintenance, which is you break into one company and you own them. But if you break into a thousand companies, they own you. Everything you think about has to be them. It is a pain. There's also quite a bit of analysis you have to do to continue this work, to do it successfully. Yeah, it looks like having a bit of Prezi issues here. All right, so, so the reason for that analysis problem is that uh, targeting is very difficult. If you've ever thought, well, I have a big space to look at, which part of it do I prioritize, which part do I really spend my money on, then you realize that some of these problems are not sort of computable. You're not thinking, hmm, you know, let's focus on IS, for example. How am I supposed to know that IS is the important thing or that that particular server is the important one to really analyze? The, these, these are big spaces of, of analysis, and it's, there's no easy way to say what you're supposed to look at next. Likewise... Uh, attackers are often going to find holes, and, and if you're good, you find holes in the underlying frameworks, which is a bit more expensive than finding individual problems. And if you're really, really good, you're finding holes in the underlying math, 
and this is just mind-bogglingly expensive, but doing either of these is helped by having a computer to use to, to do the work on. And a computer is not the thing that I'm doing this presentation on. A computer is something that is massively parallel to the point where you don't think about it as such. It is a general purpose thing. It's, it's something that could drive a car, for example, or, you know, look at cat pictures. And it's, it's got, got to have a very large distributed data storage database and uh, an API to support all this stuff. So that's all true, but there aren't that many of them. There really are only five of them or so, right? There's less than five as they predicted. The Azure system, I think, is probably reaching that direction. Uh, Google obviously has a computer. Amazon has a computer. Uh, there just aren't that many. And if you don't own a computer, it's going to be very difficult to win a cyber war. I think that, that sort of goes without saying. And hence, attacking Google, Amazon, Microsoft, possibly Apple, and a few other places that have access to compute farms uh, that can do general purpose things would make perfect sense. So the question is, if you look at all these things and you still think cyber war is asymmetric, you will still be in a pretty big crowd. And I want to talk about why attackers win to explain a little bit about why people still think it's asymmetric and why they still think all these things are sort of true. And large part of it is because the visual situation we are in. We're at RSA. Look how massive this place is. It is humongous. It is extremely well-funded. And yet, everybody is still at the mercy of 12-year-olds. Why is that? And I would say it's because it's not necessarily 12-year-olds. But uh, nonetheless, it's sort of bizarre that we seem to watch this ending over and over again. And strategists and policymakers, and generally CSOs, CISOs, think it is a feature of the cyber domain. But this is not actually true. The, the, the offense is successful currently due to a better strategy. And in some cases, a, a better culture, just straight up. And, you know, I think as a defender, you're probably sick of feeling like that. I know I am in many cases. Uh, and you're probably given the same excuses that, that everyone else is giving. This is the prime one. You only need one really good attacker, but all your defenders need to be good. I don't know about that. And then the other one is that users will click on anything. Blame it on someone else. I think a user should be able to click on anything. Why can't I click on anything? That's ridiculous. I should be able to click anything. Clicky, clicky. And of course, you know, I, I don't have the money to do security properly. Therefore, I can't do it at all. And it's an intractable problem. Impossible. Impossible. Uh, we used to have an employee who, who constantly said everything was impossible, and then he would just do it, which was humorous to us because we, we sort of saw the pattern. But, uh, you know, some of the cultural weaknesses that you're going to have in defense are that, you know, we, we rely very heavily on law enforcement. You know, if you're a corporate entity, your best hope is to go to the FBI. They will help you to the best of their ability, which is pretty good, actually. But, you know, if it's not against a guy who's trying to get rich, then they're not going to have much success. They just don't have a handle on it. Uh, this is as true in China as it is in America. And of course, the attackers read everything you do, but they don't share their work with you, except as a uh, successful cyber attack, which you may or may not have noticed. So this is a quote from Brian Snow, uh, you know, which is true in a different way. And the, the academic community, I think, you know, when governments try to do stuff, they usually try to fund academia. Uh, when they want to make big changes, they say, hey, well, that's our research engine. But in the security community, this has been a humongous failure because they, uh, they are not filled with the, the, what it takes. And, uh, you know, who's educating who in this community, I think, is very interesting. Um, I think it, it's very obvious that defenders are being taught new techniques by the attackers and not the other way around. I think that... Um, by the time the defense community has learned about an attack, they, they then work on a defense and deploy it. That takes a while. And then universal deployment or near universal deployment, you might as well give up because by the time you've done it, the whole platform is obsolete. So, I mean, the other obvious thing is that the, the defensive community is poisoned by marketing. I mean, this is just an interesting example of a game show that people are doing on the floor. I don't understand why you would do a game show, but 
uh, you know, selling and marketing is going to be a, uh, a skew goal. It is, it is completely orthogonal to getting stuff done, which is what the attackers, the attackers have a very clear metric. They either got stuff done or they did not. They're either reading your email or they are not. Whereas with defense, you have no idea most of the time whether or not you've succeeded. And hence, you have people in uh, shiny shirts selling stuff to you that may or may not do anything. And part of the problem, when you look at it, is that uh, you'll see the luminaries talk about script kitties. And they talk about them in a very derisive way, where they're saying, you know, he was just a script kitty. I, uh, you know, they look down on them. Uh, you'll, you'll hear all sorts of invectives labeled onto what they assume are young people with no talent running code that other people wrote, which, aside from the young, is exactly who they are. So... I find it very, very interesting, but being a script kitty, being an, a, an attacker, is is a skilled trade like being a plumber. And if you had a plumber come in who was 15 or 20 or 22 and fix your house, then you would not call him a uh, kitty, would you? So I think it's very interesting that, um, you know, looking, anytime you see someone who says script kitty, you can pretty much assume that they are dumber than whoever they're insulting. And the, the key thing we look at organizationally when we're doing consulting, which we do quite a bit of, is the ability to understand the impact of O-Day. We want to, when we look at an organization like a big financial, we want them to understand what the impact of O-Day is so that they can start protecting themselves for real. And the key issue is if I tell you, if you hire me for an engagement, realistically not me, but the company, and is there anything we can tell you about the platform we're about to assess that would make you abandon it or significantly change your operations? And if the answer is no, we, we would hope to rearrange the engagement to make it so that the answer would be yes. We want to be actionable. Um, and in the case of certain technologies, sometimes this is very difficult because, you know, if we look at your SSL VPN system, we will tell you that there isn't an SSL VPN on the market currently that works, that does anything useful. I mean, obviously, they do get you access, but they can't protect you once you have that access because that's not how browsers work. And uh, you'll see this over and over. CERT, actually, shortly after we started telling our clients this, CERT came out with a whole vulnerability note. They're like, uh, these products break web domain models. It doesn't work uh, as a whole, which I think was interesting. And, of course, the same sort of what can we tell you possibly about your application that would make you abandon it is true for every browser. I mean, I don't know how many browser bugs you have to have before you're like, wow, we failed at what we built. You know, our, our security model has failed. And I think Chrome's probably in a better position than the other ones, but they're all in a bad position because they're all written in C. In Chrome's case, it's cobbled together with a bunch of C++ components that um, may or may not be secure. And, you know, the, the Google team, obviously, I think, does do some interesting things, but I often think they, they get the wrong ideas from their tests. Like they spent a nominal sum of money, had a little contest, and then a bunch of people found a bunch of bugs. And their analysis was, hey, well, native client, uh, hope, good thing we found all those bugs, we can fix all these bugs, and move on, and we're good. Let's put this in the final system, which I think it is now. I'm not sure if it was, you know, it took a little while. Uh, that's, I mean, Putting a nominal amount of money into a platform and finding a bunch of bugs says that your platform is broken and you need to rethink the whole thing. And you'll see people, you know, even very smart people, do the same, make the same mistake. I put a tiny bit of money in the problem. I found some bugs or I didn't find some bugs. Therefore, it's secure. Uh, the end result has already been determined. Therefore, it's secure. And the only question is what happened in the middle. And, you know, the NSA had something called net top, the um, sort of, you want to split up classified versus unclassified systems, and you do it using VMware's hypervisor or any hypervisor, and you try to lock it down a little bit, uh, and you call it a uh, virtual air gap, and then what happened was uh, cost you built a virtual wooden bridge. So useful uh, to just see that everyone makes that mistake. You know, is there anything we can tell you about hypervisors in general that will make you not try to do that? Well, I don't think so. So what you get is uh, a few other cultural differences, which is that the attacking community is also very mature, self-organizing, and highly motivated, 
right? This is a long time ago, long time ago. But frack is even longer ago in some senses. And it, it's really a lot older. If you look at the, you know, it's seven years older than uh, the trustworthy computing memo. And it's old enough to have cartoons. I think it's a great cartoon. The, uh, the <laughs> and your useless memory corruption nonsense. That, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> and, and if you look at, you know, this is, I think he's done a good job here with the, the timelines. You can visit that and go, go check out the sort of interactive timeline. Um, but you can see just the, the level of work that went into the offensive community. Um, it's just very large. It's a mature community, and that's who you're facing. You're not facing someone who hasn't been at it for a while. And, you know, the Chinese don't call it cyber war. They call it information war, according to reports I've read, uh, which I think is very true. And I think when people say IT security is going to face off against the cyber threat, they might be missing something, which is that it really should be information security, uh, which is why CISO is called CISO. But, you know, there's really no... There's no data classification in the commercial world. I don't know if this is ever going to change. I mean, it was mentioned in the, the, the Truly Bad Computer Associates keynote, and I think it was completely lost. But doing data classification is extremely hard. I don't think you can do it automatically, really. You kind of have to make it part of your culture. Uh, and the easiest way we've found to identify this problem inside organizations is to just use the Google appliance that they have and type password into it. You can, you can do this very quickly and easily, and all of a sudden, the company will realize just how bad their problems are. You'll be like, hey, you're, uh, all the keys to your kingdom are, in fact, available via Google internally. So that, that I think, is funny. But, you know, there's a lot of companies out there doing cloud security. I had to mention cloud, of course. Uh, where to RSA? And you can't really do cloud computing without data classification because you won't know where to co-locate two VMs. And you really should say that your email, which has X sensitive things on it, can't co-locate with anything else uh, because just the level of security you require is so high and so different. So I think, you know, everyone seems to try to do cloud security, but they don't want to go through the work of understanding their actual data. It's something to look for. And the end result, obviously, is that I would say that as a capability, attackers are always going to be able to break through your hypervisor. Always. The same way they can always get root on any machine they're on, and then always get ring zero from there. So they'll always be able to take that next step and get to ring negative one, always. Uh, if you're not prepared for that, then you really shouldn't be doing cloud computing. And deep down, the other reason that cyber weapons work, essentially the other reason why attackers uh, seem to have the advantage, is that there are major technological weaknesses in current technology which is the state of software and security, and which essentially derive from the cultural weaknesses that we talked about. And part of the problem is that the defenders are really not surprising the attackers with their technological thrusts. If you look at Einstein, for example, you know, you're looking at the standard 90s technology of IDS and IPS that we know does not work, but it's the best that they think they can do. And so all the technology that the defenders are using are very, you know, uh, Alanis Morissette-like, right? Like, if you listen to Alanis Morissette, that's the technology, that's the musical genre they're in. And, you know, I think in 2007 we did a, a talk where we looked at some of the metrics, and the average m lifetime of an O-Day is something like 348 days. Uh, I don't know if this has changed a lot. I, let's just say it's a year. Um, you know, and, and you have shortest and longest and sort of average amount. Uh, the longest will continue to go because there's going to be some, if you've thought of it, then they live till the end of the platform. So it'll be 15 years or however long a platform lasts. The shortest will be a day, right? But they're going to average out to about a year. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, the, the other story that you're going to see is that, you know, a consulting engagement is rarely above around 200 hours, whereas finding an actual O-day is rarely below, you know, so they that that sort of average is going to be about 450 hours, which, you know, tells you that there's more work going into one than the other. And so what you get is a whole class of people whose job is to beat your SDL, and they succeed at that. That's the trend. 
in the resulting state of play, every SDL is broken, and people start looking at cracking the Internet's command and control. For example, uh, the private keys that run every major system. You know, we all assume Red Hat when you get a package is secured out because it's signed. I don't know if that's true. I don't know that you can send an email to secure at Microsoft.com or security at you know any major company and think it's not being read by a team of hackers. Probably a very several teams of hackers. Uh, imagine the the advantage that would give them. There's no reason they wouldn't want that advantage. And of course, you know when you do a data loss detection, it's very hard to know what the impact is because you haven't classified any of your data. I mean, you do know if you lost all your RSA keys that the impact is very large but you don't really know what it is uh, or where those keys came from or anything. And of course, uh, you know, on one hand, we have the fear, uncertainty, and doubt of, oh my God, you know, the cyber war, we're losing it, all the attackers are winning. And on the other hand, you have people saying, well, you know, it's so easy for the attackers because of the way the terrain is built that, you know, they're not that good. We have to be really good. Um, and part of it's a moral thing. We think we have better morals or whatever. Um, but... You know, it doesn't help necessarily that the defenders have, have invested all their money in products that don't work, that are essentially marketed better to them. I don't think any of the trends that you see with in terms of hacking and attackers having the advantage are inherent in the cyber domain. I think if you were a U-boat operator back in the day, and you thought, hey, this is really easy, and all of a sudden someone invents sonar, that you had a very hard transition to go through. So... Uh, or radar. I'm not sure which one it was that was better, but uh, you know, I think you're you're going to see this transition happen in cybersecurity, and in, until uh, you really do, I think it's important to also note that cyber war attacks ideology. It does not necessarily attack infrastructure, uh, nation states, religions, uh, corporations. There's a lot of things that are essentially built around an ideology, and that's what they hit best of all, you know, the concept of copyright, the, the concept that uh, you can protect your companies. These, this is really what the weapon is, is showing you. Uh, and if you are, in fact, a war fighter, I think you're going to notice that um, cyber is sort of a weapon of mass disruption and therefore more powerful because it's more subtle. It can hit certain things. You know, I can hit only babies by hitting the baby milk factory. I, I can't do that any other way, right? It's very hard. I mean, you can bomb the baby milk factory, but you can't hurt the babies that way, aside from uh, denying them some food. Um, probably that's a bad example, but the reality is you can target to certain things that you could not target using standard weapons. And that means that once it matures, it's going to get used, and it's going to get used in ways that we find abhorrent possibly like the, uh, the baby milk factory idea. So the things that you can do, this is sort of the apply slide uh, style. I want to talk a little bit about the future. For example, you can instrument your enterprise in ways that would surprise an attacker and make security decisions on an enterprise basis. For example, uh, you know, El Jefe, something that we wrote, looks at all the create process calls and throws them into a MySQL database and then lets you search and sort and find anomalies very quickly and easily. That stuff works. Uh, we have also discovered, though, that the network, and I think we discovered this as a community, is a terrible place to listen to discover anomalies. It just is not good. It's almost like when you do find something, it's surprising. And yet, most technology to do this stuff does look at the network data very exclusively because it's easy to sell is what it comes down to it's easy to measure how many gigabits can you do i can do 10 gigabits 100 gigabits doesn't really matter because it doesn't work so how, how this sort of is going to pan out in the next few years is that you're going to start seeing the 90s era sniff and alert moving to instrumenting storing it analyzing it and reacting to it and you're going to see them moving into real-time reactions that are automated uh, much the way IPS was supposed to work originally, and if it had enough signal-to-noise ratio, it probably would have. And then, of course, as, as that analysis gets faster, you're going to start seeing hackers notice, and they're going to move all the intelligence that they have now on the keyboard into the self-replicating attack tools that uh, essentially are going to be doing the work for them. So when I send a worm into your 
institution, it's going to move all of your private data around so that your security terrain has changed. No longer are the boundaries that you've set up applicable in terms of data silos. It's going to essentially mean that every top secret word document that your executive sends is also available in the accounting office and in uh, you know random offices on the very periphery of your business. That's what we're going to be sending stuff into you to change the emergent behavior of your whole organization with regard to security, and then we're going to be reaping the results, much the way um, you know you would expect us to. And so the actual apply slide here says there's things you can do. If you're a company and you don't buy things without looking at their security, then you are in a, a different place. So you want to have a process that accounts for, I bought something new, or before I even pay money for it, I say, hey, it has to be looked at by a team that knows what they're doing and make sure it works and make sure it meets our security guidelines. This is essentially what the government does in a sort of large and onerous way. Um, and for those of you who are FISMA consultants, then good for you. Uh, but the... The, the strategic decision of not moving in that direction with that product is something you have to make part of your security process. And just saying no is one of the hardest things on earth. And of course, there's the problem of outsourcing. You're going to find that, you know, in Google's case, they decided they simply cannot outsource to certain places. Uh, that, that may be a decision you have to make. And as a nation, I think strategic deterrence is, is where we're going. I think it is, you know, if you look at the mathematics of the, the problem, you have to be everywhere. That means we're going to invest more in cyber, perhaps, than in our Navy, which is also a sense of strategic deterrence. Uh, that, that's a very different thing. I think people always thought that cyber was this little thing that was going to be subservient to all the organizations that were going to have their own little cyber teams. And then we stood up Cyber Command because we're like, hmm, it's getting pretty big. We better manage it better. And then you're, you're then going to see that, you know, wait a minute, cyber is now absorbed all of cryptography because it doesn't work the other way around and it's absorbed a lot of other parts and it ends up getting ballooning out pretty big and getting a lot of resources. Uh, and then the, the reactions of other countries to how this works are very interesting. So uh, those are the, the two things I think you can do in terms of, of applying these ideas, of forgetting the fallacies and moving on with your life and trying to do cyber war correctly. Um, I don't know that we're going to have questions, but if we do have questions or simply an interesting discussion, then uh, let's talk about that now. Uh, of course, there's no one here because it's just me in my hotel room, but in our actual RSA, hopefully there'll be a back and forth. Um, but if you want to talk about it, feel free to post the Daily Dave, uh, or you can uh, send me an email directly or give me a phone call, since you probably have my phone number. Uh, without uh, any issues. Um, and likewise, if you, uh, if you liked it, feel free to send it to your friends. Thanks.